there's another one. Powdered cocaine and crack. Now, part of the motivation, correct me if I'm wrong, Glenn, because you were there in a sense that I wasn't, but powdered <laughs> cocaine was sentenced. I just mean that you, yeah, I was grown. Yeah, I know what you meant. You were, you were growner. <laughs> So I'm older cocaine, than you are. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You were studying it, but like powdered cocaine and crack, they came down harder on crack, partly because crack is um, was sold in out, outdoor markets, and selling of crack created the kind of violence that can help tear up a neighborhood. Whereas powdered cocaine was mainly dealt on playgrounds and in basements and partaken of there, and so there was a sense that crack is more dangerous to the urbanity than Ethan, you know, doing some lines in the bathroom in his parents' house. So there was that. And then there was also that Black leaders were behind those laws when they were initially instituted. Now, today, that's called just naked, you know, structural racism. It was racist that crack was cracked down on more than powdered cocaine. I have watched white guys do high fives talking about that. But was it Really, that simple? There was the idea that crack was more dangerous, and a lot of Black people thought so, which means that the idea that it was systemic racism is much weaker than we're often told. Am I on to something there, or am I missing missing that? Oh, well, it's a, it's a long time ago, it feels like now. But yeah, the, the crack powder disparity, 100 to 1, the weight the minimum weight needed to trigger the mandatory minimum sentence of the crack cocaine was one one hundredth of the minimum weight for the for the powder uh, cocaine, and uh, the mandatory minimum sentences did get applied in federal cases, and uh, that that was a disparity. Uh, it's true that um, the many African American representatives in the uh, Congress supported uh, the legislation uh, on that because they. Communities were catching hell. Um, who's the guy? Silent black majority, the the writer, a political scientist. Michael For- Michael yeah. Fortner. Yeah, Michael mm-hmm. Fortner. Who was there? A uh, black writer. It yeah. explores this in the case of heroin in New York City and the Rockefeller drug laws in the 70s and 80s. And uh, James Foreman uh, at uh, Yale, the law uh, professor there, explores the same theme in the case of Washington, D.C., uh, crack cocaine and uh, the depredations of the uh, the drug uh, disorder. And sure, there was push in the Black community for law enforcement because people were being affected adversely by the violence that accompanied the trade. But is that structural racism? I mean, of course, that invites the whole incarceration, mass incarceration thing. And, you know, I've I've written about this in a register, very sympathetic to structural racism arguments, saying in part because the people who were caught up in this were disproportionately Black, the larger society didn't pull back from the brink. Even if the intent were not explicitly anti-Black, the experiment, the social experiment of expanding the number in prison from 500,000 to 2 million in a quarter century, you know, which is a remarkable institutional uh, upheaval. We, We completely change the way in which we deal with social disorder and social dysfunction, ratcheting very substantially up the degree of punitiveness, which could be measured along a lot of different dimensions, including the very scale of people who are incarcerated. Of course, a rise in crime had something to do with that, and the more subtle historical analyses credit the fact that crime rates induced in the popular sentiment of a much greater tolerance for punitive uh, uh, legislation. But, you know, we overshot. I mean, I think it's a fair reading of history that we overshot. I think a lot of conservatives and people agree that we overshot. And in the aughts, we pulled back and those those numbers uh, peaked out and and they leveled. Now, crime did come down as well. But uh, I think the sentiment against incarceration at the scale that it had reached by the late 1990s is, is pretty widespread in this society. So we pull back. But here, here's the structural racist argument that I think has to be taken seriously, which is if the racial issue hadn't been so central in crime and punishment and in the representation of Blacks within those who were really, really on the run end of the 
uh, of the uh, punitive regime. Would we have had a different, we collectively, the polity and the culture of the United States of America, the political culture, have had a different uh, reaction, been less tolerant of the excesses if they had been falling upon people about whom we had a greater degree of concern. I don't think that's an implausible thing to say. No, that, no. you know, racial stigma that, you know, you take the history back, roll it back, not just to the aughts or to the 90s or to the 80s, roll it back to the 50s and to the 40s, roll it back into the 20s and to the teens. And uh, the insinuation of racial uh, uh stereotyping, of racial derogation, of, of racial contempt, uh, you know, it, it's hard to escape that uh, in the lynching and the enforcement of Jim Crow in the South. It's hard to escape it in uh, the uh, teeming cities of the Northeast and the Midwest and mid 20th century where, you know, the, the 60s, you see what happens with the riots and stuff. You get explosion after explosion, uh, a lot of it around the law enforcement uh, type uh, issues. Uh, the Kerner Commission, et cetera. They, they were liberals, yes. They might have been a little bit starry-eyed. Yeah, but they weren't crazy and they weren't all wrong about what they were describing in terms of the ghetto of America. It was only a quarter century after uh, Gunnar Myrdal's uh, a new, uh, The American Dilemma, which is an American dilemma, an American dilemma, which is a devastating uh, indictment uh, and chronicle of, uh, of racial subordination in the 1930s and the 1940s. So, you know, it's not like there's no there there. I mean, you'd have to be blind to history to, to think that uh, there was no there there. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, no one knew what the outcome was going to be. And once the outcome happened, sensitivity to it was weaker because people deep down didn't care as much about Black people. Plausible like, hypothesis. Yes. Plausible hypothesis. But I want to get at this. This is what Simone is thinking. This is what's taught to people in college. In the early 90s, were there white people who, although not explicitly, decided, let's target crack cocaine more because what hap- when black people create disorder, it's a worse thing than when white people do. Is that what was going on? Or was there another reason, such as open air violence? that crack cocaine was given the harder penalty. No, I actually because know a little something. That it was because of racism. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to have to report that I, I know way too much about crack cocaine, man. <laughs> I mean, because I used to be a crack cocaine addict in the 1980s, so I could have gotten my, myself shot dead out there on the streets of Boston, Massachusetts. And I go back to Chicago sometimes and hang out with some of my old schoolmates and stuff like that. And, you know, it was Chicago in the 1980s, not Chicago in the 2020s, because Chicago in the 2020s, You'd be going around the drug houses. You end up with a bullet in your head. Uh, but but it was a lot of cash money. Uh, very easily storable, small transactions, of frequent, you know, drug houses, people sliding the drugs under the door and whatnot. A lot of people walking around with guns. Um, and there was just a lot of violence. The bodies piled up. You look at the at the murder rates in these cities in the late 80s and early 90s. It makes today look like a, a walk in the park. I mean, we were, we're still lower than the peak of the violent crime rates that were reached in, in their uh, and 1990s. this is why crack cocaine was penalized more, wasn't it? That's yeah, because of the violence, because of the stories that were in the newspaper, because of the, right. you know... Uh, how many yeah. drug deals gone bad and, you know, uh, multiple homicides with uh, kids in the back room can you uh, have in the newspaper before somebody says enough? In other words, it wasn't white people thinking when black people make noise, it gets on our nerves. And so we're going to penalize more because that's what Simone is taught. Well, there probably it's was in- some of that. I mean, the crack baby uh, hysteria, right? The, the whole cohort of black babies was going to be deficient right. because there were so many mothers on crack. and there was. There was kind of hysteria about that. I, I, I'm sure you can find hyperbole and exaggeration in popular culture and certain stereotyping mm-hmm. images that get projected and whatnot and, and uh, uh, so on. But, but a lot of the uh, response was coming from Black people in those communities themselves. And 